Thank you very much. So I am, so basically I'm just a Green Party member, I have been since 2009. Um, so, you know, I precede all the green wave and all of, you know, when we got popular, I was there from before then, luckily. Um, and one of the first policies I learned about when I first joined the party was universal basic income. And I think my, my first thought on it, like I think a lot of people's was, was, oh, that's weird. That's, that's silly. You know, why would you give money to everybody? How could that be possible? Why does that make sense? Um, and I think that's the reaction a lot of people have. And so I, you know, I guess I just set it aside, but it kind of kept bubbling in my mind. And over the years, every time I kind of came up against a social problem, you know, you read the news and you hear about things going on. I find myself thinking, cool, well, if we had a universal basic income, you know, that would be so much easier. Um, and, and then over the years, as the years went on further, I got to thinking about kind of international problems and global justice problems. And, you know, I've always been very much more concerned about, I mean, you know, poverty and inequality are a problem wherever they exist, but you know, the poverty and the inequality between rich countries and the rest of the countries is, you know, so ridiculously extreme and the, the levels of deprivation that people still struggle with are so extreme that that's always been kind of the biggest thing that I would have an interest in trying to resolve. And then started thinking, you know, is there a role for universal basic income in resolving those problems? Um, and started kind of looking into it and looking into whether anybody has made a global basic income campaign and it turned out there was a very very fledgling kind of somebody had written a website about it but not taken it much further um and so I got together with somebody I met canvassing um who was helpfully a development economist um so again always go canvassing you never know who you might meet um and he uh yeah asked him if he would set up an organization with me so I did and so that's called world basic income and then six years later five or six years later um someone sent us 10 grand in the post um, as a check not as cash luckily um, and uh, so then we are using that money to make it my job on a very very part-time basis where we kind of get up to speed and get set up so now that I am the campaign director of world basic income um, and get to work on basic income all day long which is absolutely thrilling um, so that's kind of my background um, let me just get, grab my notes Bob said that things you, you were interested in hearing about were kind of green party policy on UBI um, local UBI projects um, and kind of how they could happen and whether they could happen, how they could happen. Um, kind of national and then global progress um, on UBI. And then um, I'm gonna chuck in a little bit about world basic income because it's my passion and because I'm determined to get it passed in Green Party policy out at some point when I have time. Um, so you can be my first gang of supporters if you like. So starting at the top, Green Party policy on universal basic income. So the Green Party sort of invented um, universal basic income as an idea um, or at least we were the first kind of major adopters of it that I know of. Um, we also call it citizens income and that's what it was called in the party until quite recently. It's, it's also been proposed by lots of different people famously Martin Luther King Jr um, and uh, oh my god the names of all the classic people are falling out of my head. Milton Friedman proposed something quite similar um, Thomas Paine, there you go, Thomas Paine, back way back in the day, um, proposed something like a universal basic income as well. So it's, it's an idea that's got quite a long history and the best versions of it um, frame it as a right. It's often seen as more like a dividend than a welfare payment. It's seen as like a dividend from the commons. Um, so you think of the world and, or, you know, the country and as various assets in the country as our sort of shared heritage and inheritance, and then, wealth that is generated from those um, provides dividends for all of the people who are effectively the owners of that wealth. Um, there's other framings that see it more as just kind of a more civilized way of doing welfare benefits, you know, but that as in they go to everybody so they become universal welfare benefits, but it's a way of replacing a very crap um, system that we have that, that currently supports people um, who are on low incomes or not working. Um, and then yeah, and it's got lots of different framings over the world. There's now a bit more of a framework that's about um, sort of looking after us in the future when machines have taken all the jobs. Um, 
that's definitely an interesting framework and it's about keeping you know kind of keeping the economy going keeping the people provided for when we're not able to earn an income through working or when many of us aren't so there's yeah there's lots of different ways of looking at it um, and the green party has been there from the beginning at the moment the green party is the foremost political party in the uk to be pushing basic income and um, the lib dems are supporting it and um, the labor are kind of like half of them are interested half of them are pretending that it's not a thing um Tories obviously don't give a crap and we don't care. Um, well, I suppose we do care because they are the government. But um, we are the front runners, absolutely. We're dragging this policy forward. Um, we're putting it on the agenda. And, and we've done that very successfully, I would say, um, over the last five to 10 years. So even five years ago, um, talking about universal basic income in public forums was difficult. Um, and so the Green Party didn't do it very much. Um, and we tried to get it into the manifesto several times and it kept getting kind of bumped out and it would become some like an associated policy paper that would sort of sit alongside but didn't have a budget line in the manifesto budget and um you know it wasn't really part of our manifesto but in 20 now i'm going to get it wrong i want i'm not sure if it's 2017 or 2019 because they were so close together and i can't really remember but one of those two years anyway um i think 2019 it got into the manifesto for the first time and um so yeah and that was a proper costed policy um with numbers that that was part of the main budget of the green party and also importantly it was incorporated as part of our green new deal offer so the way the manifesto is structured it's like got a green new deal for housing a green new deal for energy a green new deal for la 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 and it's got a green new deal for incomes and it's and so universal basic income is then framed as a key part of how you rebuild a green society um, based around kind of everyone having enough but also living within your planetary limits um, so the i haven't got the all the numbers i have done those in a presentation before where it kind of how much it all costs and stuff but i the what i remember is that the amount for an adult um, who of working age was 89 pounds a week and so that's an unconditional payment to every single person, every single oh, so every single adult of working age. Um, the amount for pensioners, I think, was £178 per person. Um, and then there was a, an amount for children that was in the region of £50 per child. Um, the So the child one did like taper off if you were like in a very high income bracket, it tapered down. The others were completely unconditional um, and universal. And... Um, the idea was that they were above UK benefit rates at the moment. So if you were somebody that's currently on benefits, you would be better off under this policy, although you know, not enormously so, but it was hard to make anything universal where you kind of enormously improved the incomes of people at the low end. Um, and the, the, but the real winners, and there was quite a lot of modeling done on who kind of who won and who lost. Basically, pretty much no one lost except the really rich. Um, it's not funded all through income tax, it's funded through lots of different kinds of um, tax lines. Um, including things like get, getting rid of various tax loopholes, things like the, the upper limit on national insurance. I um, can't remember if it was a wealth tax this time. I think that was scrapped this time round. Previously, it had been funded by a wealth tax. Um, ultimately, it was just funded by our, you know, the general budget that we, we created, which is funded by lots and lots of different lines. And have a look at our tax and fiscal policy if you're interested. Um, and but what was interesting about this time, the funding was that it we didn't try and make it revenue neutral. So we didn't unlike some universal basic income policies um, or proposals that are made some of them try to keep the cost within the cost of the current benefit system and th by that they, they interpret that quite broadly often including um, the state pension and various like tax allowances but they try to kind of keep it within that what I was quite pleased to see was that we didn't try and do that and I thought that was a big political commitment from the National Green Party to say, you know what, you know, this is important, you know, securing everyone's income and putting a floor on our well-being, you know, our kind of fundamental well-being, making sure no one slips through the net, getting rid of this kind of um, strivers and skivers narrative, supporting carers, supporting women um, who are not working or, you know, who are not doing paid work, um, supporting people with disabilities who are falling out of the system and not getting supported properly all of those things are sufficiently important that we're actually going to put tens of billions extra in to this system than is put in at the moment 
And what I always want to stress when I talk about that is that that's not like that's not a cost. That's a redistribution. So universal basic income is, is fundamentally a system for redistributing wealth from whoever you want to tax it from. But, you know, that's usually the rich and it, and it gives it back to everybody. You pump it back in across the whole grassroots. So it's a, it's, a, it's a system of direct redistribution, the most direct way of doing it that there is. Um, and so the Green Party was talking about redistributing tens of billions more um, directly as cash than most of the other UBI proposals out there. And that made me very proud to be in the Green Party. Um, so, yeah, oh, the final thing I need to say this is, a uh, is that it's not a strictly universal system because there's extra allowances that we put in for single parents, for people with disabilities, um, and for other people who currently get more than the amounts I've quoted from the existing benefit system. So a kind of key design principle in it was that no one, um, no one must be any worse off than they are at the moment. No, no person at the low end of the income spectrum should be any worse off than they are at the moment. And then there's various benefits like housing benefit, because you just can't do a universal basic income that's sufficient to cover housing costs wherever they are in the country. It's it would have to be so immense because like rents in London, for instance, are just so astronomical. You kind of have to maintain a means tested system for that at the moment until we've got kind of rent control and we've brought the cost of housing back down to something sensible. It's, it, I don't think anyone anywhere is proposing a basic income that's really sufficient for housing. Um, so housing benefit remains, but housing benefits kind of the least bad part of our benefit system at the moment, because although it is means tested, it's means tested in quite a basic way and it doesn't have any behavioral conditions. So you don't have to like pretend you're applying for 30 jobs a week or, you know, anything like that. It's just, it's just an income thing. Um, yeah, so housing benefit remains. Most of the extra payments that people with disabilities, like things like um, personal independent payment or what used to be called di disability living allowance, that remains. Um, carers allowance remains. So carers get a big win from this because carers actually get hardly anything in the current system. Um, and so they get their carers, carers allowance as well as their universal basic income. So a lot, so those benefits remain, but it, it would replace things like universal credit um, on the old versions of that. So job seekers allowance, employment and support allowance um income support kind of thing so it replaces those sort of central income based benefits um so that's the model um i thought it was great um i was part of the i, I wasn't part of the team uh, to be honest sorry I, I haven't been as involved in the numbers as i would like to be um i've been having babies at all the wrong times for when this all the exciting stuff has been happening but um i did go to some of the workshops and, and saw some of the spreadsheets that have been used in the calculations and and pestered the people behind them say, well, couldn't we increase it by this much and this much and this much? I think actually the end proposal was a bit higher than the, the, the versions I saw. Um, but it's, it's challenging because it's universal, it's going to so many people increasing it, you know, every one pound you increase it increases the overall cost by something like two billion. Um, and, you know, so it's a difficult balance in designing the, the, these schemes with, you know, how you're gonna fund it versus how much you give. Um, and I think we got the balance pretty good, really. But of course, the, you know, there's always going to be people out there that nitpick. And of course, there have been and there will be again. And I think the important thing to say is that, like, if, you know, we've got the principles right. It's about making sure people at the lower and middle end of the spectrum are, are doing better than they are at the moment. It's about making sure that everybody is getting a basic income. You can tweak the details. And, you know, I can't wait for the day when we're having political arguments about whether the universal basic income should be you know, £100 a week or £150 a week. You know, that, that sounds like a great argument for us to be having. Um, and we're a very long way off that. So it's kind of the focus really is on building the principled, you know, winning the principled argument first um, and, and then worrying about those details later on. So that's about Green Party policy. Um, local UBI projects. So this is an interesting one. So a lot of the energy of the basic income movement has currently moved into a network of organizations called the UBI Labs. Oh God, I think I'm bothering my baby. I'm just gonna move my computer around into the kitchen so I can, he can't hear me so much. Oh, excuse the mess. Okay, let's try this. Um, so UBI Labs were started up in Sheffield um, and they, um, and the idea was that they kind of experimenting with different universal basic income proposals and um, ideas. And then I think, and then the idea is that they start to experiment with actual experiments with real life basic incomes going on. 
that's been really successful, I think, partly because it's a localized um, system. So you have UBI Lab, Sh Lab Sheffield, and then other ones have been springing up all over the place. And so people are able to set these up and then kind of work locally to make political progress on universal basic income. Um, the yeah, so one of the big um, things that those they've been doing is putting motions to their local councils, getting support for um, universal basic income pilots in their um, towns and cities. And lots of councils have passed these motions. And so that's been really exciting. It's given green councillors something exciting to do that's kind of on the social justice side of things, um, which is, you know, it's a good way of showing support for um, people on low incomes in your city, um, which I think sometimes it can be difficult for green councillors to you know, to, to demonstrate their commitment to social justice and economic justice and kind of, you know, to left wing um, ideals in, in local politics, because a lot of that stuff that, that happens at a national level. So I think it's been useful in that respect. I think what hasn't been answered really yet is how these pilots are going to happen. And, um, you know, Bob was interested for my thoughts on that. And I do have some um, thoughts. The main, so, the, well, there's kind of two main ways that these can happen. The first is that um, you get national support from the government um, and they turn off people's benefits in that place and give you the money that would have gone to those benefits and you use that plus some other money potentially and actually run a proper pilot. That's clearly not going to happen under a Conservative government. It's something you can imagine, well, certainly a Green government doing if they were considering a full rollout of universal basic income. Um, maybe a Labour government would do something like that. Um, but that's not something that's really on the cards at the moment. The second option is to get some kind of, is get funding from somewhere and run a project that gives universal basic income in addition to the benefits and the wages and that, that everybody already has. Um, so you're not really then testing the funding side of it, but you are testing the distribution side of it. You're finding out what effects it has on people's lives. Although obviously not in exactly the same way as if it was a final proposal, because you're still maintaining um, other elements. So for instance, if you're on universal credit in those pilots, people are still going to be having to go to the job centre and do all the, jump through all the hoops and stuff because they're still in that system and they're not going to want to give up that income just because they've got another basic income coming in. So um, it's challenging to do pilots that really replicate the end result until we have a government that's supportive of that. Um, but nevertheless, there's really good reasons to do pilots. Um, the biggest reason is it keeps the conversation about universal basic income going. And, you know, it's almost impossible to keep a political conversation going if nothing's happening. Like, you know, it, just having a, just, you know, something being a good idea is not enough to keep it on the political table, on the media table. Whereas actual projects happening in actual places with real people receiving money and having impact from that, that's a story. And, you know, people that are receiving the money obviously learn about it. And lots of those people will be the kind of people that, you know, never go to political me meetings, never, you know, hear about these kinds of ideas otherwise. So you kind of get it out to people that, that wouldn't know about it and create new support bases among those people. Um, and you keep the kind of the political and the media and the social media conversation going. So those are all brilliant reasons to do pilots. And I think basically that's how social movements are built, right? You have to keep those conversations going. You have to be taking action wherever you can, even if ultimately that action isn't sort of in an obvious direct way getting you to the end result. It's, it's all about building kind of, yeah, building dialogue around a topic. So um, one way that I think, uh, so yeah, so basic income projects can be funded by grant funding if you're lucky enough to find some. Another way that they can be funded, which people are starting to experiment more and more with, is um, via self-created currencies. And so local currencies are already something that lots of people in the Green Party are interested in. And there's, there's a good one in Stroud, I think still running, called the Stroud Pound, that was running for quite a long time and might well still be. And then more and more local currencies are being created as cryptocurrencies. And cryptocurrencies are kind of another kind of, not necessarily local, but a private, non-government non owned currency creation mechanism. And really the two kind of crypto and, and local currencies are kind of, they're both taking the same basic idea, which is to mirror what happens in the normal money system, but to do it outside of 
kind of state supervision. But by doing that, you, you actually have the ability to create money. Um, and so some basic income experiments around the world are now using kind of created money um, to pay basic income. And then obviously the challenge is to get people to accept that money um, or, for, or for that money to be exchangeable for normal money that people can accept. So this sounds kind of like total like fantasy economics um, until you and when you first hear about it, basically, um, when I first heard about how money was created in private banks, I was like, that's not true. <laughs> um, and I actually went back to university to uh, do another degree to find out that indeed it was true. Um, and so. But I'm still, despite having been years in the basic income movement, I'm still only just com coming around to the idea of using money creation to fund it. Partly that's because. I don't want that to be the whole way that it gets funded because I believe in redistribution. I believe that we need to chop wealth off the top of the economy and pump it back in at the bottom, as well as just create money and pump it in at the bottom. Also because you can only ever create a modest amount of money um, to use as basic income. You can't just sort of create immense quantities of money because that would cause inflation. Creating modest amounts of money is okay. It doesn't create inflation and there's lots of evidence, lots of experience, not least of quantitative easing that demonstrates that. Um, but yeah, so you, you, know, you would only ever be able to have quite a small basic income via money creation. But what it does mean is that it, it provides a very real funding source for local projects. And the project that my organization, World Basic Income, is about to start in Malawi is being done with cryptocurrency, which has just been, is, has essentially been created for the purpose of paying it out as basic income. So this project is like, you're getting this like hot off the press. We are literally, making this happen it, within the last few weeks um, and it's going to be starting within the next few weeks but the way it works is that there is a, a cryptocurrency um, called Cello Dollars that's made by a company called Cello um, and they're like whizzy tech geeks who understand the cryptocurrency in how it works and, and they basically create money in a very similar way to a bank and they have some currencies that are like Bitcoin where the value zooms up and down um, but they have other currencies, uh, they have another currency called Cello Dollars, which is pegged to the US dollar, at an exchange value of one to one. And they use kind of traditional money management techniques to maintain that value. So they like, basically like quantitative easing, they sell, they, you know, they release more currency and put it into the market if there's too much demand. And they, and they buy it back from the market if there's too little demand or the other way around. Um, so they, yeah, essentially they create this, this currency that can be exchanged one to one for dollars. Um, they've donated a huge chunk, like hundreds of millions, I think, of this currency because they can create it from nothing. So I guess they have plenty um, to a company called Impact Market. And then we are working with Impact Market and with partners in Malawi to, um, to distribute that money as basic income. And Impact Market then make a partnership with like a local um, financial technology company that enables people to, um, to take their money out in local currency. So um, people who have smartphones can do that anyway, because you just kind of log on to like an exchange thing. And it's all made very simple. People can do it in a very simple way in these, in these pilots. They, and so they log into an exchange thing and just exchange it for, for normal dollars or for whatever your local currency is. Um, but we're, we've got a partnership going so people can do that without having a smartphone. They can do it with just an ordinary, you know, like, a, like an old Nokia brick kind of mobile phone. So um, yeah, so in that way, somebody somewhere creates some cryptocurrency out of nothing, but the actual end result is that a bunch of people in Malawi, like probably a thousand or two thousand people, depending which village gets chosen locally, are going to start receiving a basic income um, in actual cash that they can actually spend. So, you know, much as my, you know, it's taken me a long time to get here in terms of my faith in this system and my understanding of cryptocurrency. And the other night, I like I had to had to write a one pager about cryptocurrency and the blockchain that could be understood by Malawi and local government officials. Um, and that was very educational for me because like this was all so new. But, you know, it, it actually makes a lot more sense. It's actually a lot closer to what already happens in the money system than I realized. Um, and it is a way of doing universal basic income pilots that just wasn't available before. And I suspect probably won't be available forever either because it is essentially I mean, the money system itself is already pretty unregulated, but it's, you know, there is some regulation, but cryptocurrency is deeply unregulated. And there's already some countries like India, for instance, are making moves to potentially ban private cryptocurrencies, partly with a view to their government doing their own 
um, digital currency. And our government has a consultation about doing its own digital currency. So that's where rather than private banks creating the money and make and profiting from creating money, because that is indeed what happens at the moment. And um, that's why the bankers are also rich. They have a money printing device in their computer system. Um, that is the government will print the money and, and potentially pay it out to citizens as basic income, for instance, as one way of spending it into the economy. So, um, yeah, so private cryptocurrencies that can be used in this kind of grassroots, slightly kind of dis disorganized way, probably won't exist forever. So now is actually a great time to kind of jump on this wagon um, if, you, if you can find the companies and the people that, that have the skills to make this work. Um, so that's one way of doing it. At World Basic Income, we are uh, we're writing a book about worldwide basic income, which I shall explain in a minute. But one of the ways we are we're trying to think we're trying to look at how would you move, how would you create a global basic income because that's what we want to do. Is there a way you can build up to a global basic income from the local and build it up towards the global rather than having to sort of go in straight at the global level? And the best way that we can think of is to start it by having a, a kind of federated local currency that's, but it's, but you have one global currency um, that's being created in, a, in an appropriate and regulated amount that's based on sort of real, real economic calculations and, and population calculations on the world, which will be presented in the book. Um, but you have, so, you know, rather than having the Stroud pound that can only be spent in Stroud, is it, said, is it pronounced Stroud? Is it Stroud? I'm actually not sure. Um, you know, and then you have whatever, you know, the Manchester dollar or whatever, you'd instead have, you know, the global coin and any locality that chose to accept it could accept it. And then you could buy goods, you know, I could buy goods in Stroud and in Manchester, you know, at, and I could buy goods from Buenos Aires and from Mumbai, you know, if those localities chose to accept it. And, and by chose to accept it, I mean, you know, businesses would have to be encouraged perhaps by local government to accept it. Um, lo local government might start choosing to accept it for you know the payment of a proportion of council taxes for instance but um you know and as this thing grew more and more companies would want to accept it because it's money that people have available to spend because they're getting it for free so i can sort of see a way that you could start a kind of local currency creation system that could actually gradually build up to being a global basic income or a portion of the eventual global basic income that we would eventually receive um so to go into that a little bit more now, because I'm not going to let you go without telling you about my um, favorite thing. Um, the project that we're running for Worldwide Basic Income. So as well as running this project in Malawi, we are writing a book. We are running webinars. We, are, um, we have a website. We are promoting the idea of there being a single global basic income. It's not instead of national or local basic incomes. It's as well as. So the idea is that it's a fundamental underpinning income that every single human on the planet receives as a human right. Um, we, when we first started, we were talking about $10 per person per month. So absolute peanuts, but you know, still probably transformative to people in extreme poverty. Um, then after a while and after a lot of calculations and after talking to our international advisory board, which is experts all over the world, um, we, rose, we raised it to $30 per person per month. So that suddenly becomes relevant to a good third of the world's population. Um, I'm now um, kind of redoing all that research into how you could fund a worldwide basic income um, and finding more money streams, better money streams, finding good ways to kind of monetize the global commons um, in ways that are fair, in ways that are not that radical. Um, and the amounts that we're coming out at is $100 per person per month. And so um, that's every single person. So we're talking about children, newborn babies, older people, working age people, everybody, $100 per person per month. So, you know, if you're a household of two adults and two kids, that's $400 per person per month. So even for me, I've got two kids and a partner, $400 a month will be like massively helpful in my house. And then to, you know, at least half the world, two thirds of the world, this would be absolutely completely transformative. Um, so yeah, we have been researching that. Um, we are writing a book that's going to present that research. We'll also be putting it on the website and putting it out on blogs. Um, yeah, I guess I'll leave it there with, with worldwide basic income because it's such a big topic and I could probably go on forever. Um, why don't we go over to questions and then people can ask me about uh, whatever they fancy.